So how does one exactly make a graphics card review video in today's market on a card that virtually none of you are gonna be able to get your hands on, and even for that matter, afford, considering the black market pricing for new cards like this, once they're snatched up by you know who, on a YouTube channel dedicated towards budget PC tech and gaming. This is how. Hello and welcome to the Scatterable channel and today this is my review slash hybrid benchmarking video on the RTX 3080 Ti when paired up with today's mainstream gaming CPUs. And on that note, I made that snarky comment at the beginning of the video to kind of keep those comments and push them out. They aren't the main subject of this video. This is not a video criticizing the current GPU market or how available these graphics cards are at launch when it comes to retailers. This is none of that. Leave those comments on another video, but not this one, because I think the results I've accrued from testing out the most mainstream and popular CPUs you can get right now for affordable pricing with this card are way more interesting than that just that same old hate, bigotry, whatever. Take that out of this video. That is not this. If you actually wanted some good news, I just closed on a house in another city where I'll be moving to and bringing my expanded YouTube operations to because it'll have room to have a full-time editor and secondary shooter in-house with me cranking out really cool videos. And that happened this weekend, finally, like on the deadline when it needed to happen and I was about to move out a month from now, the closing date is right when I move out. Everything is good, it worked out so I'm gonna be moving into a permanent location in a permanent city. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know where. But uh, yeah, that's some good news to kind of highlight on this sort of video if you're looking for some of that positivity. Anyways, we will definitely be taking a look on this graphics card. And again, the CPUs we'll be using to test the title of this video. But before any of that, this is a word from our sponsor. If you're finally looking for a 60% mechanical gaming keyboard from a big brand with a strong reputation, then look at the Corsair K65 Mini. Featuring swappable keycaps, Cherry MX Speed, silver switches, along with an 8K Hertz polling rate, you can finally get that smaller keyboard you've been wanting that'll fit right into the Corsair IQ ecosystem. So check it out using the link at the top of the description. So this is my overview of the 3080 Ti in one sentence. It's a baby RTX 3090. Virtually in all aspects, it is the same as the 3090 other than the actual core, the VRAM amount, and the TDP. Most notably the VRAM because it's half the amount, but it's a 3080 cooler with objectively a 3090 underneath the hood. So the results should be interesting even when it comes to cooling, which I did look into. Anyways, if you go ahead and take this GPU and you look at all of the individual suites and features that NVIDIA is putting down for this card, ranging from DLSS, NVIDIA Reflex, NVIDIA Broadcast with RTX Voice, hardware accelerated GPU scheduling through Windows, and of course, its legendary ray tracing performance, this objectively will be probably the best graphics card on the market for gamers. I'm leaving this pause in the video to, so you, you can kind of, yeah, <laughs> for gamers. Anyways, the design of the 3080 Ti Founders Edition card is almost identical to the original RTX 3080 Founders Edition card, though I believe it runs a little bit hotter, at least from my test bed that I was using, which was this pre-built Digital Storm PC for my Intel results. I was getting just about 77 and 78 degrees Celsius at the maximum when it came to just regular general gaming with this graphics card. I didn't put it through any serious GPU stress tests because you're not gonna be using this thing at 
all the time because it is just that fast and there's not that many games on the market that can completely tax this graphics card. But yes, it runs just a little bit hot. So with that said, I chose five mainstream budget gaming CPUs to pair up the 3080 Ti with. Well, budget for the most part, excluding one. But those are the Ryzen 5 5600X, the Ryzen 5 3600, the Ryzen 3 3100, the Intel i5-11400 and the Intel i3-10100, which should be eerily similar to the 10105 coming very soon. It's only gonna be a refresh. It's not gonna be an official Rocket Lake CPU coming from Intel for their i3 lineup. So they'll just be kind of bundled in the same area. So the three most interesting things I would look at for in the benchmark section are the 11400 versus the 3600. So seeing how well the new budget king of CPUs compares up against the former budget king of CPUs. And again, the 10100 versus the 3100, similar scenario, Intel versus AMD, and how much of a gap the 5600X can pull out amongst all the other CPUs, because if it can't, that means that it is bottlenecking the 3080 Ti. So maybe we'll see some results where the 5600X is not pulling out that huge single thread of performance advantage that it's been known for amongst these other budget gaming CPUs. So with that, let's get into the results. Let's start with some very high frame rate games like Rainbow Six Siege, where as you can tell, the 5600X is most certainly pulling ahead over the 11400, 3600, and the rest of the field when paired up with that RTX 3080 Ti with that Vulkan API at ultra settings at 1440p. So pretty much what I expected, which is good to see that the 5600X is still mostly utilizing that 3080 Ti where I don't see any serious bottlenecking so far. Similar scenario with CSGO on the benchmark map, the 5600X is most certainly pulling ahead of the field, but interestingly, the 3600 is not too far behind the 11400 considering the extremities of the numbers we're getting across the field. But now onto a CPU-based gaming benchmark with Civilization VI on the AI benchmark. Here, when it's more focused on the CPU, the 11400 is actually not too far behind the 5600X, and that could be attributed to its increased single core performance with that Rocket Lake jump over Comet Lake. And again, the 3600, 3100, and 10100 kind of follow suite in an order that I would have expected. Then going on to Forza Horizon 4 at Ultra Settings, DirectX 12 at 1440p should be fairly graphically demanding. And here, the results kind of speak for themselves, though in this case, the 3600 pulls ahead of the 11400 and the 10100 and 3100 are just about matched with a higher 1% low of the 10100. But again, the 5600X is enjoying its comfortable lead. Then going on to Fortnite with no ray tracing turned on, just DLSS set to performance at epic settings where we just want the most frames per seconds possible at 1440p. We get some very excellent results across the board. And here again, we can see the 5600X maintaining that really comfortable lead and the 11400 really flexing on the 3600. And same goes for the 10100 versus the 3100. But just when you thought things were gonna follow suit for the last two benchmarks, I turned on ray tracing and things got a little bit interesting. So here on Minecraft Bedrock Edition with ray tracing turned on only at eight chunks, the 5600X is not pulling out that really big lead that we would have expected. It's only about, I'd say like 10 frames per seconds more than the 3600 and the 11400. So there it's not really pulling out a whole bunch even versus the four core options. And then I think this only cements this sort of trend in place because if you look at Cyberpunk 2077 with ray tracing set to the ultra preset as well as ultra graphical settings, the 5600X and 11400 match frame rate. And objectively, the 5600X should be the faster gaming CPU all around. So I think we have finally seen our first clear sign of bottlenecking with the 5600X and the RTX 3080 Ti. So what does this all mean? Well, I think one, this is a ridiculous graphics card, even on a 5600X, a $300 gaming CPU, which in a lot of titles, I believe can utilize a large chunk of the potential of this graphics card. But when you turn on ray tracing, one of the things this card can do really good at, you're gonna want 
that top of the line 5900X, 11900K, so on and so forth to make the most of this ridiculous graphics card. So disregarding availability and obvious pricing issues that'll come with this graphics card, it really is, it is just another awesome feat from Nvidia. And of course, if you look into how much they already offer with this card beyond the hardware with all their suites and programs, DLSS, ray tracing, you know the deal. This is the best graphics card for gamers, but it's not gonna get in the hands of them, at least for 99% of people looking into this card. So it's just, ah, uh, oh, man. I recommend this card if you can get your hands on it, but I highly doubt you can, which is my only real issue with this card. Other than that, it is bulletproof. Maybe other than running a little bit hot, but that's really about it. I can only hope this card will truthfully get into the hands of the people who have supported NVIDIA all these years, the real fan base, the real core base of the people who buy up these cards. Otherwise, it'll be slightly pointless because I'm sure you already know what's been happening. Anyways, that is it for today's video. And I wanna thank you for watching to the end of this video if you're here, because yes, a lot of people aren't gonna be interested in this graphics card, but it still means a lot because that means you enjoy my perspective on these PC parts, you enjoy my video making style, all that still feels fulfilling, even disregarding the context of the video. So I wanna give a thank you to the real people <laughs> who watch till the end, thank you. So with all that said, thank you for watching, and this is the Skyroll Channel, signing out.